All right, here we are at the uh, class for the uh, book of Exodus, Exodus for Beginners. We are on uh, lesson number two, and the title of this lesson is The General Outline. We're at that part. Uh, Moses uh, before the call, and we're going to cover Exodus chapter one, verse one to chapter three, verse nine. So we've noted in our uh, previous lesson that uh, Genesis provides approximately 2000 years of history in general. Uh, and uh, we find the beginning of that golden thread that I talked about of the Bible's main focus, which is the story of God's people. Remember I mentioned in lesson one, a lot of things happen in history, you know, a lot of things going on. Uh, and the Bible picks up the story you know, in Genesis and, and it gives you a golden thread throughout history, throughout the world history. Uh, and as we follow that golden thread, we follow the story of how God chooses a man, from that man creates a, a people, from that people creates a nation, from that nation uh, comes the savior and so on and so forth. And so we're in the very early part of that uh, story, the story of uh, Exodus, uh, where God is going to uh, create a nation out of the, uh, out of Jewish, uh, out of the Jewish uh, people. Now in Genesis, uh, we're introduced to, to individuals, uh, patriarchs like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, along with their families, all the way down to Jacob's son, Joseph, and how Joseph became the visor or the prime minister of Egypt. And uh, through his position, he saved his family's life by bringing them to live in Egypt and providing them with food during a period of prolonged famine that was taking place in the land of Canaan where they had originally come from. Uh, the book of Genesis ends with Jacob and his extended family, 70 people altogether, living freely and comfortably in the fertile land of Goshen, which is in the northern part of Egypt in the Delta region. And so the book of Exodus begins by filling the reader in on what has taken place since that time and uh, uh, introduces two individuals around whom most of the events in Exodus will take place. Also, it is in the book of Exodus that God will go from speaking primarily to individuals and begin speaking to a people through certain individuals and then to speaking to a nation through a set of laws and regulations that reveal his will, which is now available to all the people for all time. So we see that progression of uh, God's communication with people in Genesis, he's talking to one person here and one person there, you know, in Exodus, he is talking to one person, Moses, and Moses is talking to a group of people and they wait for, uh, you know, Moses to say what God has told him. And eventually uh, God gives to Moses the law and the observances. And so the people will have uh, the law and the observances uh, always with them and they can access what God is saying uh, without having to wait for Moses all the time. They now have God's word that will now be uh, guiding them. So uh, today we're going to look at uh, outlines for the book of uh, Exodus. There's 40 chapters. So there's a lot of different ways that we can chop this book up in order to examine it. Uh, it can be divided or outlined in several uh, ways, as I mentioned. And I want to give you samples taken from another source book that I used in prepping this study. Uh, great commentary, Truth For Today commentary, uh, the one uh, by Coy Roper on the book of uh, Exodus. So here are some of the outlines, uh, some of the ways that you can outline this book, all right? So first uh, is the two-part outline, very simple type of outline. Uh, two part outline, part one, the deliverance, chapters one to 18, you know, how God delivered the people, how he freed them from Egypt, chapters one to 18, the covenant, chapters 19 to 40, you know, the giving of the law, the giving of the information 
on the tabernacle and so on and so forth. That's the second part of it. And in the covenant, there, you know, there are two, you know, two parts to that covenant section. Uh, one is the covenant and the commandments given in 19 to 24. And then from 25 to 40, the actual building of the tabernacle itself. So there's the two part outline, very simple, gives you an idea of what the material is all about. Uh, another type of outline, the relationship outline. Uh, this is from Warren Wiersbe. Um, uh, so he has three parts, uh, what he calls relationship outline. Part one, redemption. Uh, the Lord delivers his people. So it's the Lord and his people, chapters one to 18. Second part, the covenant. The Lord claims his people. Uh, verses or chapters 19 to 24. And then the third part, worship. The Lord dwells with his people. You know, the, uh, uh, the covenant is given, the tabernacle is built. You know, this is where God will dwell with his people. All right, so that's the relationship uh, outline, redemption, covenant, and worship. Another type of outline, the experience of the people outline what the people experienced in outline form uh, in the book of uh, Exodus. So the experience of the people outline begins with God's people delivered. Again, God freeing them from the uh, Egyptians. God's people led uh, out into the desert uh, by Moses. God's people made into a covenant nation where God makes a covenant with the nation. These are the, these are the rules, these are the, uh, the details of the covenant and the people accept to be in a covenant relationship with God. Then God's people given instructions regarding the tabernacle. Now that the people are in a covenant relationship with God, God gives them information about the tabernacle and along with that, you know, the process of worship. How will they worship him? Because after all, he's God. God's people uh, in sin, the golden calf, uh, the golden calf incident with uh, Aaron, you know, creating a golden calf and the people worshiping it. And then God's people constructing the tabernacle, chapters 35 to 40. After that incident, after all of that takes place and uh, the people are renewed once again with God and the covenant is renewed uh, and the people get busy and they begin building the tabernacle and the, uh, the, uh, the balance of the book of, of Exodus uh, tells the story of the building of the tabernacle itself. Now, <clears throat> the advantage of these outlines is that they give you a snapshot of what the book is about and the flow of information concerning the main topics. The uh, downside, of course, is that they're not always practical to follow as class outlines because there is, uh, there's more information to cover than time for a typical Bible study class. I mean, you take that two part outline, for example, you, know, you, you do 20 chapters in the first, and, or 18 chapters in the first and the 22 chapters in the second. Well, who's got time to cover 18 chapters uh, in a class, even if you gave an hour uh, for the class time, which we don't, uh, you couldn't cover all that material. So it's easy as an outline, it gives you a snapshot of what the book is about, but as a study tool, it's, uh, it's a little more difficult. For a fixed number of sessions, like, like this class, as I mentioned, we need an outline that summarizes well the material at hand, but also gives us time to adequately study the contents of the book so that uh, we better understand the book of Exodus. And we come away from our study when we're finished uh, with new information about this second book of the Pentateuch. You know, the Bible class is not interesting if you don't learn something new. So we, all of us here know something about the book of Exodus and, that, and that's a good thing, we have a base. Uh, but when the course is over, hopefully everyone here will know a lot more about the book of, uh, of, of Exodus and uh, that increased knowledge will be edifying. That's the whole point of knowing the Bible better, it's edifying. 
Uh, one more example, and it's the one we're going to use. It's called the expanded outline, the expanded outline. So here's the expanded outline. There's the introduction first, where uh, you have a summary of Genesis because that's where everything begins. Uh, you talk about the author and the date of the book of Exodus, a kind of a critical introduction. Uh, the geography and history of Egypt, because uh, Egypt plays an important part in the story of Exodus and a summary of the purpose of the book of Exodus. And as you know, uh, we covered this introductory material in the first lesson that we did uh, last time. Second part would be called Deliverance One, uh, chapters one, one to chapter six. Uh, this part tells the story of, uh, or we review the story of Israel being enslaved, how that happened, why it happened, uh, how it's affecting them. Uh, the deliverer is introduced, Moses, the deliverer, chapter two. Uh, verse one to chapter four. And then uh, in this particular uh, deliverance section, uh, we study the initial failure. So there's an attempt at deliverance, but it fails the first time, chapters four to six. Uh, and then there's some information about Moses and his brother Aaron, their genealogy, and uh, some other details that are given in this section. Section number three is deliverance two. So the second attempt at delivering the people, chapter six to chapter 12. And this is broken down, uh, God's promise of success to Moses when uh, God uh, um, initiates contact with Moses, the miracle of the staff, the staff that Moses uses in the miraculous things that God will do, and deliverance by means of plagues, uh, chapter seven to chapter 12. There are 10 plagues, right? We, we know enough about the book of Exodus to remember that uh, God freed the people from uh, the Egyptians uh, through a series of plagues that were visited upon uh, Egypt, its people, and also uh, its king. The fourth part is the Exodus itself. Uh, explains uh, the departure from Egypt, uh, the people's departure from Egypt and their journey into the Sinai uh, desert go to, uh, in going to Mount Sinai where Moses will meet with God. Then the final uh, section, section five, the covenant between God and Israel, uh, a large section, chapter 19 to 40 or to chapter 40. And this one is broken down into six parts. The covenant is made between God and the people. The people react, they ratify the covenant, they receive the law and the covenant, chapter 20, the 10 commandments, for example. And then the plans for the tabernacle. There are six chapters where God is simply giving to Moses the various plans and instructions on how to build the tabernacle where they will, where the people will uh, uh, worship God. Uh, then the apostasy and restoration uh, where Aaron, uh, you know, uh, builds a, a golden calf and the people fall into idolatry and uh, they're eventually restored and continue on. The building of the tabernacle, they've got the plans. You've got six chapters where you have the plans and then you've got another five chapters describing how the people actually built the tabernacle using the plans. And then the final one, uh, the erecting and the consecration of the tabernacle, along with the, uh, the priests who will, uh, uh, who will serve um, uh, in, the, uh, in the tabernacle. So uh, this expanded outline covers all of the material in summary form, but provides enough information so the reader is familiar with the general story outline before he even reads the story or studies the detail, like today. We've just looked at this here, you know, just looked at the outline. Well, we already have an idea of, 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 of the flow of the book and the material that we're going to cover. So with this outline, um, you always uh, know where you are in relation to the big picture or the main story. So this is the outline that we're going to follow for our study of Exodus. 
Uh, by the way, uh, Exodus in the Greek translation means departure or a way out. In Hebrew, uh, it means names or the book of names, meaning that God knew and had not forgotten the names or the identity of his people who were enslaved uh, in uh, Egypt. So we begin with the uh, introduction. And as I mentioned before, we've already completed this in our first lesson. We had a summary of Genesis. You know, Joseph who has become second in command in Egypt and has received his father Jacob along with his brothers and family, 70 people in all, into Egypt in order to protect them from uh, a severe famine that was taking place in Canaan. This is the final happy scene in Genesis. The last scene is, you know, Joseph is reunited with his family. They're safe, they're comfortable, and the story ends, uh, ends there. Then we talked about the author and the date of Exodus, just as a, um, you know, what we call a critical introduction using existing records and oral histories and his own eyewitness of the times, Moses wrote all of the books of the Pentateuch, which are the first five books of the Bible. And we said he did this between 1447 and 1400 BC. Another part of the introduction was the uh, history and the geography of Egypt itself. And we spent considerable time reviewing this when we covered these two subjects. Uh, but for review purposes, uh, suffice it to say the very uh, following. Uh, Egypt is completely dependent on the Nile River, which flows the length of its uh, country. Most of its population lives near its shores and fertile Delta Valley that uh, supplies its food. The Delta is up in the north there, supplies food and water. Egypt. Uh, is an ancient civilization having been established 3000 years before Christ. So when we're talking about an ancient, I mean, and it's still there, isn't it? 2000 2, years you know, after Christ, uh, it, the country of Egypt is, is still there. Uh, so it's a very, very old, um, uh, very, very, very old uh, nation. Uh, its most significant period is recorded in the Bible as the nation where the Jewish people were forced into slave labor and the nation completely ruined by plagues sent by God through Moses in order to release the Jewish people from their, um, uh, from their bondage. And uh, we'll spend a considerable time uh, reviewing that uh, in a little while. Uh, and it appears again, in other words, the country of Egypt, it appears again in the Bible playing a minor role in local wars and geopolitics of the times, but never again attains its former influence or power as, as today, for example, is not a world power, still exists in the same way. Remember we talked about that golden thread throughout, well, you know, uh, the golden thread goes through Egypt early on when it talks about you know, Joseph and then eventually the people being released. Uh, we, we read about that in Exodus. But after that, you know, the history of Egypt keeps on going, but uh, you know, the, the, the thread of the Bible moves on to other, to other things to tell the story of the eventual coming of Jesus. Uh, the purpose of the book of Exodus, Exodus explains in detail how God transformed a large group of people loosely held together by family and tribal ties into a single nation held together by their faith in the one true and living God. The book of Exodus provides the manner in which God instructed them to both express and nurture that faith until the promise it made was fulfilled. And of course the promise was the promise of the, of the Savior. Now that our, you know, our outline has been laid out and we've had a brief review of the first section of that outline, which is the introduction, it's time to look into the text of the book of Exodus itself and move into part two of our outline, which is entitled Deliverance, Deliverance number one, chapter one, uh, uh, one to chapter six, verse uh, 27. 
So the first part of that is uh, Israel enslaved. And we'll read a couple of verses, chapter one, verses one to seven, read along with me. It says, now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. They came each one with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in number, but Joseph was already in Egypt. Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. So the Jews arrived and lived as free men in a part of Egypt, which was abundant in food and water, as well as grazing land for their animals. Like I said, it was the land of Goshen, which is in the Delta Valley in the, north, uh, the northeastern part. So God blesses them. And as a result, they not only grow in numbers and wealth, but they also grow to rival the native Egyptian population as they spread out and they lived in all parts of Egypt. So God is fulfilling his promise to Abraham and Isaac that their descendants will be as numerous as the stars in heaven. We read about that in Genesis chapter 26, verse four. So the people are experiencing a rapid population growth, even though they're living in Egypt, which is not their nation. We read, continue to read in chapter one, verses eight to 10. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them or else they will multiply and in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. Now the term uh, did not know Joseph doesn't mean that he never heard of or was not aware of this part of uh, Egyptian history. As a matter of fact, a very important part of Egyptian history. It means that uh, he did not recognize or honor the Jews out of respect for what Joseph has done. You know, when, when you say, I don't know you, doesn't mean I don't know you. It means I, I don't recognize you. He didn't recognize Joseph and his uh, contribution. That was then, you know, in his, you know, in his thought, that was then, and this is now, where the size and strength of the Jews, not to mention the liability they presented should they align with Egypt's enemies had to be dealt with and had to be dealt with right away. And so the Pharaoh uh, tried to solve the quote is, uh, Israelite problem using tactics that would weaken them and limit their growth. For example, at first he oppressed them by conscripting them to serve in a kind of a slave army of, of workers charged with uh, building projects. This was hard work, which took them away from their farms and herds and families. This didn't uh, work uh, since they continued to grow in population and strength anyways. He then, he meaning the Pharaoh, he then doubled down by going to the root of the problem, you know, too many births of healthy babies. And he instructed the Hebrew midwives to destroy any male babies at birth. Well, this plan also failed as the midwives refused to carry out this type of abortion, claiming that Jewish women were so strong that they had their babies quickly before the midwives could arrive and you know, interfere with the birth. And so God blessed these women with babies of their own. So having failed twice with these indirect plots to undermine the growth of the Jewish population, the, uh, the Egyptian monarch enacted a radical pogrom uh, authorizing any Egyptian to kill any Jewish newborn made uh, by drow a male, excuse me, by drowning him in the river, uh, but sparing the newborn, uh, uh, the newborn females. You know, uh, if we can't get the midwives to kill them, well then I give the right to any individual uh, Egyptian to kill uh, uh, you know, young boys, young uh, Jewish boys, just drown them in the, in the Nile. And so from this, we go to deliverance one. Remember I was saying the first attempt at deliverance 
is uh, explained to us and uh, we are introduced uh, to, uh, to Moses, uh, chapter two, verse one, to chapter four, verse 26. And we begin with Moses' early life. So let's read chapter two. It says, now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens uh, walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, because I drew him out of the, uh, out of the water. I want you to notice uh, both the providence of God here, as well as his faithfulness to his promises. First of all, at first, the Egyptians oppressed Israel and the more they oppressed them, the more they multiplied and prospered. Next, the Pharaoh tried to abort the babies, but more babies were born. Even the midwives who couldn't themselves conceive were enabled to have babies themselves. It's kind of adding insult to injury here. And then finally, the Pharaoh required that all Hebrew boys be thrown in the river. The ultimate result of this strategy was that the child who was to become the deliverer of the Jewish people, Moses, was rescued from the river by the Pharaoh's own daughter and raised in the court of Pharaoh himself. As a matter of fact, the little girl, his sister, that would have been Miriam, uh, suggested to the Pharaoh's uh, daughter, do you want me to find a nurse for the baby? And she said, sure, go ahead. And who was the nurse? Well, the nurse was his, his own mother. So the theme of this episode is that nothing works when man, any man, even kings, oppose God. No one can defeat God, and especially no one can defeat God's plan. So we know that Moses lived 120 years and his life can be divided into three 40 year sections. First of all, he lived as royalty in the court of the Pharaoh in Egypt. He was the, the, uh, the son of the princess. And so he had access to all the advantages of the court, which include of course, good food and comfort, but also education and power and influence and how to you know, use that. He also lived 40 years as a shepherd in the wilderness of Midian. And 40 years he served as the leader of the Israelites, leading them eventually out of bondage. His name given to him by the Egyptian princess who found him means drawn out of water. The princess knew he was a Jewish castaway and had him nursed by a Jewish woman who was his real mother. So this helps explain why Moses, although recognized as royalty by Egyptians, was aware of his Jewish heritage and his genealogy, being of the bloodline of the tribe of Levi, whose tribe would eventually provide the priests and the servants of uh, 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 the servants uh, who would eventually work uh, and serve in the tabernacle and then later on, of course, in the temple. So the Bible, you know, it glosses over the details of Moses's life as an adopted son of the princess. Can you imagine that? We could have had a couple of chapters 
on you know, Moses as the, you know, in the royal court, but you know, that golden thread I talked about just passes over that and moves directly to the event that'll take him to the second phase of his life. And that would be uh, uh, as a shepherd in Midian. So let's read about that in chapter two, beginning in verse 11, uh, all the way through 14. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. He went out the next day and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, why are you striking your companion? But he said, who made you prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, surely the matter has become known. So this here uh, is Moses's attempt at leading his people based on human wisdom, human strength and tactics. Uh, in other words, revolution. Uh, but two things happen to nip his attempt in the bud. First of all, his own people reject him and mock him. And secondly, he's afraid for his life and he runs away. And thus ends the description of events during his first 40 years of life and his personal attempt at being a leader of his people. Then we go to Moses, uh, the second part uh, of his life, uh, his life in Midian. This next period in his life is briefly summarized in just a few verses where he escapes to the land of Midian. Uh, there he meets the daughters of his future father-in-law, Ruel, after saving his daughters from some aggressive shepherds. He eventually marries into the family and has children, and he settles into the quiet life of, of a shepherd. Um, uh, and these uh, are all the details given uh, concerning his time in Midian. Again, the Bible could have devoted, you know, several chapters. I mean, 40 years, you know, he had babies, he lived there, he got to know rule, he worked, but none of that, you know, in just a few verses, the Bible gives us, you know, the, the highlights of the 40 years. In the meantime, the narrative in the Bible switches back to the land and the people that Moses has left behind. So we go to chapter two, uh, verse 23, to 25, it says, now it came about in the course of uh, those many days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel and God took notice of them. So this now indicates that the time has come for God to deliver his people and he sets the scene for the calling of the deliverer. And of course the deliverer will be Moses. So we get to the next section of our outline, the deliverer, Moses, chapter two, uh, verse one to chapter four, verse 36. Uh, and we, um, 26 rather. And uh, we, we begin with the call. Uh, the call uh, that God makes to Moses. Uh, chapter, uh, uh, verse one rather, let's just read that. It says, uh, now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So let's just stop there. I want you to note that you know, Moses' father-in-law is called Jethro here, which is an alternate, uh, an alternate name uh, for the same man referred to as Ruel in chapter two, verse 18. Uh, he was a priest, it mentions here, uh, not through the tribe of Levi appointed by God, that was Aaron who would be appointed by God, but he was a religious leader worshiping the God of Abraham. And the reason for that is that the Midianites were descendants of Abraham, 
but through Abraham's wife Keturah, who he took after the death of Sarah. And so the Midianites were descendants of the children of Abraham uh, that he had with Keturah. And we read about that in Genesis chapter 25, verses one to six. This explains where their belief in the God of Abraham came from and how Jethro became a priest uh, offering worship to the God of Abraham. So uh, in this story, uh, Moses sees the burning bush as he was pasturing his flock near Mount Horeb, Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, which in later uh, times referred to as Mount Sinai, the place where God will give Moses the law and appear to him in the future. So let's keep reading verse two and three. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. So here God appears and communicates to Moses in a bush that burned with fire, but was not consumed. This uh, type of uh, event is known as a theophany which is an appearance of God in some form, in this case, as a bush, a burning bush. The text says that the angel of the Lord appeared from the burning bush. Now the angel of the Lord is mentioned several times in the Old Testament, but is in fact the Lord himself, since he describes himself as such in verse six. In essence, he is the Lord Jesus appearing in angelic form before he appeared as a man, Jesus. And it, follow, it follows the natural order of creation. You know, the angels were created first and then man was created, right? And so Jesus first in the Old Testament appears as an angel and then uh, appears as the man, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, and so the burning bush is the first miracle of Exodus. However, there are not many miracles in the Old Testament, uh, considering there are 39 books in the Old Testament. Miracles, uh, when they do take place, uh, tend to be grouped together in clusters at certain points in the history of Israel. For example, at the Exodus, which we will see uh, shortly, or during the conquest of Canaan, uh, which uh, we read about in other books of the Old Testament. Uh, uh, during the prophetic ministries of Elijah and Elisha, we see many miracles. Miracles occurred at times of crisis for Israel, at times that its uh, national survival was threatened. And so we continue reading about this particular uh, miracle in chapter, four, uh, chapter three, verses four to six, it says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he says, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. So God calls Moses twice to assure that the call was real and Moses answered immediately without any, any hesitation. Uh, this demonstrated that Moses' heart was ready to hear what God had to say. Despite his circumstances, Moses' faith was strong and seeking God's will. And so God confirms that this appearance is real and that Moses is standing before the true and living God. And he does this by having him remove his sandals. This confirmed that this was not a dream or some kind of hallucination. Also, it demonstrated that the physical space that Moses occupied was now holy and sacred because God also occupied it. And the removal of his sandals was his way of acknowledging this reality. It was his way of expressing his faith in the reality of this event. Moses sees the miraculous proof of God's presence 
in the burning bush. And now he hears the voice of God identifying himself. I am, this is the way that he usually begins. I am the God worshiped by your fathers all the way back to Abraham where the golden thread of their history began. And so Moses then acknowledges that he is in the presence of God uh, by hiding his own face. You know, the typical human reaction to being in the presence of angels or uh, the divine being usually is fear or recognition, recognition of our own unworthiness or sinfulness. Isn't that what Peter said, you know, when he, he falls down before, or he kneels down before Jesus in the boat after the, the, the catch, uh, he, he says, go away from me, Lord, I, I'm a sinful man, right? We're, we're, we're painfully aware of our sinfulness. Uh, a lot of times when we, when we, uh, when we meet someone for example, some brother or sister, very saintly, very godly person, right? We're made aware immediately of our, of our you know, inadequacies you know, in front of this person. Uh, we completely defer to this person uh, because we know of what they have done or suffered in the name of Christ. Well, can you imagine being in the presence of an angel or in the presence of the Lord himself, you know, multiply that feeling, you know, uh, a thousand times. And so, as I said, from Adam to Moses, to Isaiah, to Peter, men are completely, and women, are completely overwhelmed and awestruck when in the presence of God, many uh, afraid that they, they won't even survive the experience. And so now uh, God gives him the purpose of his uh, call in, uh, uh, in verses uh, seven to nine. It reads, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. So God reveals to Moses why he has appeared to him before he actually calls Moses into service. He is aware of both their sufferings as well as their cry for help. He will deliver them from the power and the enslavement of the Egyptians. He will bring them to a prosperous land that he will give to them. And he specifies exactly what land this will be by naming its current occupants. And he repeats the initial idea that he has heard the cry or the prayers of his people concerning their suffering. And so before calling and sending Moses to fulfill his commission, God identifies both the problem, which is the suffering of the Israelites and the solution, bringing them to their own prosperous and presently occupied land, uh, occupied by other uh, nations. And so uh, next time uh, we uh, will continue with our class, we're going to examine Moses' response, very, very interesting uh, response. And uh, I encourage you, uh, of course, as always, uh, to read ahead uh, chapters three to five. Uh, I think you've already read those, but uh, if you haven't, I'd encourage you to read that and make it a lot easier. Very interesting dialogue between God and Moses that we will uh, continue. I uh, mention again and remind you, uh, if you need workbooks, um, uh, it makes the study a lot easier, makes following along a lot easier. Even if you don't write any notes, you know, just following along uh, makes it a lot easier. And again, you can just download those for free from our uh, bibletalk.tv uh, website. Um, and that's you know, free download, uh, it just costs you the paper. Uh, or if you just want one already, already printed with a cover and so on and so forth, you can always order it and have it uh, shipped uh, to your uh, residence. Well, that's uh, the end of uh, lesson number two. 
Uh, look forward to seeing you next time as we pick up our story with Moses' response to God. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>